It's nice to be in the relative tranquility of Singapore uh, after the last few days. We live in truly unique times. And I'm not just referring to what happened in Hong Kong in the last few days, although that's part of it. And we live in a truly unique region. So the lecture this evening really is about the question, what is relevant architecture in such times and in this place? Now, a lot of people are involved with making shapes of inventing skins. For me, that's not it. That's not it. Because in order for architecture to be relevant, it has to be anchored in the culture of its time and its place. And today we have cultures from the past and the present converging. We have values from different regions colliding. And it's important that architecture is anchored in those cultures. And of these cultures, I could identify a few. Those of identity, spatiality, community, density, connectivity, and materiality. Let's talk about identity. Now, it's natural that when architects conceive works of architecture, they're expected to produce works of identity. But in this region, especially in China, we are expected to do something a bit more. The identity has to be regional. Identity has to be, in many cases, they call national. Now, what does that mean? It means that we are actually burdened with expectation. And it has resulted in architecture as diverse as the bird's nest by Herzog, as well as a certain gold coin building in Guangzhou, shaped like gold coin. Now, for me, the past or our cultural heritage does have objects or matters of significance, like artifacts, landscape, tectonics, lifestyle. But for me, these would just provide the beginning of an idea, the genesis of an architectural thought that would then need to be resolved and explored and analyzed and experimented to tailor to contemporary needs and use before they become genuine works of architecture with a genuine identity. Take an example, the Guangdong Museum that we did in Guangzhou. Urbanistically, it's a dialogue with Hadith's Opera House across the green axis in Guangzhou. But conceptually, the inspiration comes from a treasure box in our history. Boxes that are intricate objects in themselves, but which are actually holders or containers of invaluables inside. So that is the beginning of the idea. But having conceived that idea is really the resolution of the architecture, the space, the circulation, the diversity, of functions coming all together to become a contemporary museum, which is actually the crust of the matter. So the end product is an intricate facade, but beneath it, actually, it encompasses a diversity of spatial experiences. Like the space underneath the overhanging box would be ideal for outdoor sitting and outdoor cafe like the grand atrium directing traffic around to the various galleries, the circulation, 
transition lobbies between galleries, which are basically themselves black boxes. And this is the space where you could regain your contact with the city. Or breakout spaces within galleries to relieve museum fatigue. And even in the atrium itself, which is supposedly the main circulation, these are spaces for temporary exhibitions, temporary seating, or installations. So at the end of the day, whether the resulting building is like a treasure box or not is totally irrelevant. It's the idea of the intricacy and the mystique and the association with valuables to be explored on the inside which informs the architecture, which at the end of the day is totally resolved for the working of a modern museum. Another example is the canal village in Boan, Boao in Highland Island in the south. Here is the, really the lifestyle of, contempt, of traditional Chinese living in southern China along canals, which started this idea. Because in the old cities, or water cities, the canal or the river is a center of life for travel, for washing, for socializing, for entertainment. Now, today, we have to meet all the modern requirements of a residential cluster. So we will have access roads, we have surfacing, we have all the modern necessities. But the water is still an important element for access, for socializing, for interacting with each individual dwellings, both physically, providing individual peers, and metaphorically, by establishing a sort of ambience between architecture and the water. The play of light and shadow of the rippling surface of the canal on the white walls. In this development, you wouldn't find wooden gates, you wouldn't find traditional tiled roofs, you wouldn't find old stones. No, it's all contemporary and simple. And yet, the relationship between architecture and water and activities that it fosters and nurtures follows the same idea. So genuine identity to me is something born of a successful resolution between contents and form. The past could inspire the beginning, but the outcome has to be the result of a rigorous process of architectural exploration and resolution tailored to contemporary uses and needs. The culture of spatiality, our perception of space, especially in China, is conditioned by history, reflective of the way we live, we use space, we appreciate a space. Because in ancient China, or in past China, space is not a phenomenon only. Space is a tool. It's a tool to organize social structure, for example, in traditional houses, where generations are arranged in an order. The master, the first wife, the second wife, the third wife, and so forth, different generations. Space is also a tool to condition the mind, creating through spatial sequences, processions, the mood of anticipation, respect, and awe, especially in the appreciation of public buildings like temples and palaces. Now today, we no longer have two or three wives. Well, we may have, but they will not be living together. But the modern fa Chinese family is very typical, like a project in Shanghai. It's a family that will be organized around the notion that different members living within one wall would have both a diversity of open spaces for communal sharing and for private use. So the organization is an intertwining of habitation, 
court jobs both communal and private. And because the site is in an area of the town where there's no view, no natural landscape around, the whole space is introverted. So you would have the entry, and you would have the living, dining, which is communal. You have the master's quarters sharing a common garden. This is the entry public forecourt. And then you would have probably one child or two children, each with their own courtyards. And you would probably have your parents or in-laws living together with you because they are the people of the current generation who needs support. And then you may have the guest house for the occasional guests. So that's a typical Chinese family, contemporary Chinese family. And you want such a spatial configuration so that they or the other members could have their own autonomy. And they could also interact when they want to in an attempt to keep them together as long as possible. So a rather unassuming entrance through the entry communal courtyard. And then actually through the living areas, you see the garden at the back, which is for the family. And down one side of the corridor, you have all these different individual rooms for the children, for the grandparents, with their own individual courtyards. Now, space, as I mentioned, is also a tool to condition your mood. In this project, the City Library in Guangzhou, we use a sequencing of space and an intertwining composition of open and relatively confined space to create a journey in three dimensions, rather like the sequential courtyards in ancient Chinese housing or palaces, but this time in levels going up from the entrance, from the entrance to the lobby, to the general reading area, all the way to the top, to the uh, rare book collection. And all these are the quiet reading areas with bookshelves. So it's a three-dimensional sequencing of procession. Today, as I mentioned, we have very different family structure. And today's public buildings are very different from temples and palaces. They might be libraries, they might be hotels, they might be museums. But traditional spatial strategies are in many cases still an inspiration. They will be adapted to fit the modern style of living. And because of modern building technology, we have new spatial configuration to cater or to foster the appreciation of different types of public institutions. Space could also be used to foster a sense of community. Now, as a Chinese tradition, the sense of community is cherished and is reflected in such physical structures like the earth building, rounded, introverted building, in the walled villages, in the housing courtyard houses. The sense of community being related to family, tribe, village, is really for protection, for safety, for a sense of belonging. Now today, we, all, so we always also treasure a sense of community. But it's not for the family or kin. It's really for a group of common-minded people sharing same interests and values who like to get together share environment to, so that it could be conducive to mutual communication and exchange. And the sense of community is always cherished in projects like schools and universities. So in this project for the art school for the Hong Kong Polytechnic, the School of Design, sorry, for the Hong Kong School of Polytechnic, is really about using architecture to foster the sense of community, not only within the design community, within the design students, but between the design school and the rest of the campus. The building is tucked at one corner of the campus, very 
confined footprints, usually the case in Hong Kong. So the challenge is, how do we deal with the necessary stacking up of floors, both private and communal, and still create a sense of community? So the key is to break away horizontal barriers and create a continuing spiraling volume of space. So from the connecting bridge to the campus, you go up by a series of spiraling volumes to different studios and the student function areas, while at the same time, the public could gain access to the lower part, the auditoria, exhibition areas, uh, resource centers, and so forth. At the same time, the building embraced an existing football field used by the main student body. So there is a sense of community created within the school and between the school and the whole school community through different facades of varying transparencies. So on the lower level, relative public, you have a lecture hall, you have a view towards the football field. On the upper level, the studios in a spiraling arrangement are grouped around a communal quid space with flexible exhibition and lecture uh, cubicles. And you look at the green roof. This is the view inside one of the studio that you see the other studio spiraling down and the green roof that leads you to the library and the outdoor informal gathering spaces. The other example is a whole university, not just one school. It's a new small university for Hong Kong, the Chu Hai College, soon to be called Chu Hai University. Again, as in most cases in Hong Kong, it's a very confined footprint. But within this footprint, we have to provide everything that a university needs. So it is teaching facilities, the classrooms, the student dormitories, the staff dormitories, the offices, student union, library, lecture halls, sports center, greenery, all combined into one mini city. Section showing classroom clusters with sunlit internal corridors, the administration, the library spanning both wings, the studios and the lecture halls in the base, and then a green campus on the roof, centrally placed within the building mass. So you either enter through the entrance and take a shuttle to the main level there, or you take a grand staircase and walk up a landscape deck. And as you enter at the ground level, this is the area where all the lecture halls are grouped and where the gymnasium come uh, uh, gathering hall could be opened up by a sliding partition to be the most public of the university's functions. The space in the library that span across the two wings at the top with a view of the sea on one side and the hills on the other side. And how the university is both compactly composed but sufficiently open to allow an intermingle of open space and interior space and allow through view and air ventilation through a rather large-scale public building. So as you reach the top, which is the center of the university, and looking down, this would be a green lawn for gathering, for performances, for ceremonies, with a sea at the distance, the library spanning across on the top, and then at the top with the, maybe not the Starbucks, but the cafeteria, student union above, and the classrooms and the library all around you. This is the main social hub of the, of the university. So the sense of community is really results from appropriate place making. 
and it depends on an appropriate manipulation of ambience and scale, and on a correct mix of use and users. We're no longer catering for an introverted sense of security and belonging, but we are providing an, uh, an inclusive environment that encourages exchange and communication. Now, from these two examples, you probably feel by the compactness of the buildings, by the smallness of the footprint, that there is another very important culture in this part of Asia, in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Singapore, the culture of density. Density, if I could say it correctly, is perceived somewhat differently here in Asia, especially in Hong Kong, than, say, in North America. Density was once synonymous with poor living conditions, congestions, unhygiene environment, poor environmental consideration, and so forth. But increasingly, the attributes of a dense urban fabric is being felt. And if architects could cater to the sensitive environmental consideration and provide, at the same time, an optimum density, both in individual pieces of architecture and in urban fabric, then would actually contribute to the future well-being of our cities and of our habitats. The demands of density also requires, in many instances, for architects to explore new building types, like this example, I Square in Hong Kong, in one of the densest urban areas in Chim Sao Chui, occupied previously by the Hyatt Hotel. This would become a multi-story retail center. 20-something floors, all of shops, cinemas, restaurants, retail and entertainment. The strategy is to arrange the massing so that it, at the one hand, respects the existing context of roof lines and so forth, exploiting the original height limit in Kowloon before Kai Tech Airport was removed to have views for the restaurants and the upper floors. Utilizing a strategy of express and local escalators to create a journey, a public street from the basement of the MTR station all the way skywards, which you see and feel actually from the city. And when you go up, the strategy is to arrange a series of mini atria, atria for luxury items, atria for lifestyle and casual eating, this atria for cinemas, and then the different proper restaurant floors. And as you go up, there's this continuous visual dialogue with the city. Exploiting the existing skyline for views, and where the building always speaks to the city from the outside. So this is a new building type, in a way, of maximum vertical stacking. But at the same time, a journey which is a continuation of that on the streets. The other example is a hybrid building, a hybrid grouping of disparate functions all within a very small site. That is the existing building occupies a site to be developed next to the Cross Harbour Tunnel crossing in Hong Kong. It's going to be a building for a, hostel, a hotel for the Polytechnic, a school of hotel management 
for the Polytechnic, and a residential block for senior staff for the Polytechnic, all combined into one development, into one site. So the strategy is a correct grouping and composition of the various functions. The staff housing facing a private open space, suitably screened from noise. The hotel rooms, 300 and something rooms, exploiting the views in different directions. The hotel school, tucked under, with the common functions between the hotel and the school, such as the big hall, the teaching restaurants, uh, the uh, seminar rooms and so forth at the base, combined with the hotel atria. At the same time, maintaining visual and ventilation permeability between two sides of the site so as to enhance the microclimatic condition of the neighborhood. So you see the hotel, the school, the residential block, the entrance to the school, which is a short walk from the main campus of the Polytechnic itself, the entrance to the hotel on the other side, facing the existing hotel district of Chim Sa Chui, with the atrium, the hotel, the school, and share facilities at the base. So everything going vertically. And when you reach, again, a level which is above the previous height limit level in Kowloon City, you have views in three directions. And this is where the spa and the swimming pool area is located. And the start of the proper hotel, a really functioning commercial hotel run by the University of Hong Kong Polytechnic. So the embracement of density initially through necessity, but now increasingly through appreciation, has really given rise to forces and opportunities that architects has to harness, control, and exploit. It also requires the architect to look beyond its own building, beyond the site, because in such conditions of density, it's important that the architecture would not compromise the fluidity and the connectivity of the surrounding urban fabric, which is also in a very dense state. And in many instances, it's actually an opportunity for the architecture to enhance the connectivity of the public realm in the city. Hong Kong in that regard is blessed with already a three-dimensional framework of public connectors, like bridges, escalators, subways, that is our new public realm, going through different levels and different directions, going inside buildings and outside, creating new interfaces between the public and the private. And in many instances, when we design a new building in such a dense neighborhood, we add to or exploit the existing network to improve the connectivity of the city with the ultimate aim of reducing our reliability on the driven motor car. So an example is the East Kowloon Cultural Center in Hong Kong, which we are now designing. It's in a neighborhood of Kun Tong, a dense neighborhood. It has to provide cultural facilities like theaters and black boxes and uh, music labs and so forth. But it's also an opportunity for us to knit together this, new, this old neighborhood in such a way that pedestrian commuting from one side to the other, one direction to the other, is actually enhanced which means that the cultural center is not just a place for cultural performances. It is a receiver of the community from different directions. Whether they want to engage in cultural activities or not, that doesn't matter. It's a place where they could pass through and enjoy. In this case, 
the culture is actually radiated through this engagement with community to the surrounding. Now, this particular site has two characteristics. On the one side, there is an existing Ma Transit railway station with the concourses and stations at the upper levels, which means that the ground level on this side, this road, is dead. Nothing we could do about it. It's dead. It's just the uh, servicing and uh, loading and loading and so forth. On the other side, however, which is where the old district is, is still likely with front street front shops, great crossing, ground level open space, market stores, still very vibrant. So the strategy is for us, first of all, of course, to locate the major cultural facilities, which includes a 1,200 seat theater, a judge stage theater, 550 seat, black box theater, dance studio, music lab, rehearsal rooms, exhibition areas, and so forth. But we create a network of public circulation routes and decks, both around and through the building from the MTR station across this busy highway, bring them down to the ground into various open spaces that are created out from the profiling of the building envelope, while at the same time, people go into performances which is the red arrow, could use some of the access points, but will not be in direct conflict with the commuters. They intertwine, but they do not interfere with each other. So it's a fluid volume of public movement that takes care of both commuters and audiences to performances. So as you come in through the uh, pedestrian footbridge from the Mars Transit Railway Station, you arrive at a landing, and you're going to performances, you go down a slight ramp, and there, these are the accesses to the two theaters. But if you are just passing through, then you either go down the stairs, then you go into an exhibition area, and you start directly onto the open space on ground level on the other side. Or you go up, this bridge overlooking the theater, and you're connected to another footbridge, future footbridge, that will bring you across the road to the residential neighborhood across the road. And these are the routes in the other directions leading to other destinations with exhibitions and art shops along the way. And here with the open space suitable for outdoor bazaars and performances leading to a cafeteria at the far end, and then linking you up to the black box theaters and the music labs on the upper floors. And within the foyer itself, there will be informal seating for impromptu performances and concerts. Another example, government headquarters, the epicenter of the last few days' activities. But it's really intended to be an urban connector. Because the complex itself has to accommodate, like most sites in Hong Kong, multi-functions. And in this case, it accommodates all the major government bureaus into one building. It has to accommodate the legislative council and the, all the councillors' offices and all the other meeting rooms. And it has to accommodate the chief executive's offices and the exco chamber. So it's like the White House and Congress and, uh, 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 and all the government departments all in one site. But this is such a valuable site on the waterfront that we decided on day one that it should not be solely occupied by officials and legislators. The focus is a link, not the buildings. A 24-hour open all-the-time link 
that bring people from the center of the city all the way to the future waterfront promenade, which is still under construction. So while the officials and the VIPs would come in from the side to their own individual forecourt, and somebody would come on the side to electrical forecourt or to this civic square, which is now becoming famous, which I'll show you later on, on the side, the main theme is really this link, a celebratory walk all the way to the harbour front. So even though there might be demonstrations and pleas or delegations, whatever happening on both sides, this would all be still dedicated for the use by the public. That's the idea. So the chamber, huge chamber for the legislators on one side, the uh, chief executive's office complex outside and inside. But it's this route that crosses the road by a green deck and then slopes down slightly, gently towards the waterfront. So as you walk down, you always see the harbour. And part of it is about the communal functions for the government offices, the public meeting rooms and the press conference rooms. Part of it is on solid ground, part of it is above uh, major traffic trunks. But for the pedestrian, it feels uninterrupted all the way. So as you walk across the green deck, pass through under the uh, government bureau offices, and then gently slipping down with the harbour in the, in, in the distance. And to both sides, there would be even more secluded corners, fish ponds, uh, sculpture gardens, and so forth for relaxation. Now, even in the heat of summer, this is a popular place for Sunday concerts, sometimes for very tranquil relaxation, Filipino armors on Sundays, families. For Hong Kong, it's the first strolling freely on lawn without restriction. Sometimes they get a little bit serious, gathering of Christian groups, expressing concerns for some gay legislation. Sometimes smaller demonstration in this civic square, which used to be fairly open, accessible by different groups. Sometimes it gets heated, like this demonstration in 2013, where people are upset the government only issued two, three TV licenses instead of three. And then so far, the biggest sit-in of all in 2012, again led by a group of students, protesting against the proposed introduction of national education uh, 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 academic program. So connectivity is not just about physical language. It's both visual and spiritual. And it requires a genuine fusion of architecture and the public realm. And it requires a creative intervention of the architecture in the public realm so as to encourage and enhance the dynamics of encounters and movement and exchange. Now, in all the examples that I've shown, you could see that in terms of the use of materials and construction, we are not addicted to any particular material. We don't use, for instance, FFA concrete in all our buildings or uh, 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 aluminum panels, or no, because in Chinese tradition, materials are chosen for their appropriateness, appropriateness for the purpose, and are glorified for their constructability and the method of being manufactured. So in most of our projects, you see a range of materials that we have used. Sometimes more traditional light timber and pebble, sometimes use of aluminum extrusions even for the uh, skylight in our villa, and sometimes the use of perforated panels and uh, metal and glass to create a sense of intrigue 
and visual transparency and translucency. And sometimes when we, for instance, in the Museum of Kunming in uh, Yunnan, when we want to create a metaphor of the rock forest in the neighborhood, we use perforated aluminum panel to give it the texture, the opaqueness and the translucency as it requires. A museum that will be open, opening next year. But we do use traditional materials. But only we, we use them only when there is a purpose, not for romantic or emotional reasons. We use it because there's a need, like the Bamboo Theatre, Bamboo Pavilion, we, we did in Berlin in the year 2000. Because in Hong Kong, especially, there's a tradition of erecting temporary theatres for performances during festivals, where there is a need to erect it quickly, within six or seven days, and to dismantle it quickly and where materials could easily be transported and cast away, and where the material is sustainable, being bamboo cultivated in the western province of China. We use traditional lashing methods, but a new contemporary structural form to create a pavilion which is both structure and skin and enclosure at the same time, as a dialogue with the House of Culture in Berlin. So pavilion which we use for opening ceremonies, for seminars, for temporary performances, or simply for sitting down. Now, all these brings me to my final two projects. One, Peter mentioned earlier, back more than 30 years ago, almost 30 years ago, Paris, Opera de la Bastille, the other, the West Kowloon Cultural District. Now, in this project, we subconsciously, in our involvement of the architecture, look towards the urban culture of the city of Paris, which I experienced and recall as a student traveling that city. Because it's an urban infill, and apart from all the performances and the symbolic values associated with the opera, it really has to sit well in the city and enhance the city. And as we call Paris is all about facades that form street frontages, rhythm, texture, monuments, visual access, vitality on the streets. So our building, apart from making a strong gesture towards the July column in the square, we carve out a street through the sites between the backstage facilities of the opera, which are all visible through a transparent facade, and the ancillary facilities of the opera consisting of galleries and bookshops. So there will be vitality on the streets, like most streets in Paris, and where history is always within visual distance, and where the street edge is respected and defined and reinforced towards the important historical monuments. But the more recent project is the West Kowloon Cultural District. And here we consciously look at both past and current cultures in Hong Kong. Because we feel that only by anchoring those cultures in this district could it become part of Hong Kong and be sustainable. So the site is really that on the tip of West Kowloon, looking across on Hong Kong Harbor. On the northern part of the site are really the latest high-rise, ubiquitous commercial developments, offices and hotels and residences. On the eastern part is Kowloon Park, one of the rare city parks in Hong Kong on a hill. And then towards the north, further north, is our old district, with all the color and the texture and all the vitality and typology of existing streets. Steps, alleys, slopes, signs. But the idea actually generates from something in the past, a very famous painting in China, the Gingming Riverside. Very famous, but for me, what is 
notable about that painting is three things. First of all, it's really not something that you could appreciate at one glance. It invites discovery and exploration, very much the aim of our district. Second, it's not really about landmarks, not about iconic buildings, although inevitably there will be iconic buildings such as these, but it's really about the celebration of the commonplace, meaning squares, streets, alleys, steps, parks, informal seating. And third, it's not an isolated entity. It's not a white elephant. It forges connections in all directions, both physical and metaphysical. So the strategy is to divide the site into three zones, three belts. The green terrain, starting from a park at Great, an undulating park that would merge with green roofs as he reaches eastwards and eventually links up with Kowloon Park across the road on a green deck. And then facing the commercial development on the north side is the city link, where we put all our offices, hotels, and studio accommodation. And then sandwiched in the center is the cultural core, where all the major cultural functions are sandwiched. Of course, there will be overlaps in certain cases. And then overlying all, we bring in the existing street grid from North Kowloon. The scale, the width of the streets, but orientate them in such a way that some of them catches important landmarks across the harbour, always recalling what Hong Kong Island has to offer. And then overall, we bring in a three-dimensional grid of open space and network, squares, terraces, promenades, alleys, a resulting master plan. We also took care to group functions with a view to foster the sense of community that I talked about. For example, on the eastern end, we put in the theater of Chinese uh, uh, opera because it's closest to our old neighborhood. And we put next to it a modern theater. And then in the center, uh, this is a square that is next to the Chinese opera where we could put on traditional Chinese performances, bamboo theaters, or dragon dances. And then towards the center, we put in the M Plus Museum and the concert hall, a synergy of performing and visual arts, right next to the uh, uh, high speed railway station in the future, and then with a few steps going down to an open air concert hall on the promenade with floating pontoons extending the shoreline. And then further west is the grouping of the theaters and the cinemas, all the drama facilities. With alleyways, grand steps, which could act as natural audience platforms for outdoor performances. And at the western end is our main park, which is undulating, rather like the one we did in Tema, and where the large uh, 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 performance venues will be actually tucked under the green roof overlooking Lantau Island and beyond. And if you experience it in 3D, going through it, this is how you would feel. It's about recapturing 
the traditional Hong Kong public way. The streets, the alleys, the little squares, the necessary tramway for speedy travel. It's about correctly mixing functions and mixing users so there is synergy and a sense of community. It's also about forging connections both within the district, of course, and with districts outside, both physically and metaphysically. So for me, architecture is never about creating shapes or skins, or rather not only about creating shapes or skins, no matter how provocative or sexy they are. It's really about anchoring architecture to our relevant cultures of the day, about rediscovering them and reconnecting them. Thank you very much.